we got Steve Sable on the line. We're going to get right to the, the STC hotline. Steve, how you doing today? I can't hear you very well. Steve, how you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. Oh, man. This is Barbershop J. How you doing, Mr. Sable? I'm doing okay. That's good. Mr. Mr. Sable, uh, Rick Morris uh, from the FDH Lounge. We've all come together here uh, with uh, Walt and Barbershop Jay on their program here today to talk to you. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a pleasure to, uh, to to get a chance to hear about what's uh, what's going on with NFL Films. Uh, are there any latest uh, developments going on that you'd like to plug right now? I know you're starting to get a presence on Hulu <laughs> well, sure. and YouTube. Uh, well, uh, in about a month, we're going to be starting our uh, show, Hard Knocks. That's going to be on HBO, uh, where we're going to spend the whole summer with the New York Jets. So that that's going to be great. Uh, we're also doing two specials for the NFL Network. Uh, one is a 90-minute documentary on Bill Parcells and his career and his contributions to the game. And then also, starting in September, we're doing a 10-part series on the 100 greatest players in NFL history. We have a uh, blue ribbon panel of over 90 Hall of Fame writers, former coaches, scouts, players who have all voted on the top 100 players, and uh, we've converted that into a uh, 10-week television series. So we're pretty busy. Mr. Say, well, this is Barbershop Jay again. I all right. I ask you, and no offense, but I got to ask, some of the team's profiles so far on the hard, hard Knocks series have had difficulty in this, you know, that, that season or whatnot. Almost like some of the players that are profiled on the, on the cover of Madden. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, t- tell me a little bit about that. Do you think it's... No, nah, that's a bunch of BS. That doesn't... And if you, you could go back to when we started, we did the Chiefs. Well, when they came, we spent the whole summer with them, they were in first place for the first months of the season. Okay. Uh, after that, they had some injuries and didn't do as well. Okay. Uh, the Cowboys, we did the following year, they started out strong. But again, it, they, uh, you know, as the season progressed, certain things happened and they didn't do as well. I don't think you could uh, blame that on hard knocks. And then last year... When we did the Bengals, everyone said, oh, what are you doing now? They're last place, and they're all the problems they've had. But we thought they would be a good story, and then the Bengals end up going to the playoffs. So I, I think, really, if you talk to the teams that we've done, this is our 10th year doing hard knocks, that because we're there in training camp, it raises the tempo. The guys know that every uh, – Every uh, Wednesday night at 10 o'clock, uh, if they've been caught sleeping in a meeting, it's going to show up on, on HBO. And it raises the tempo, the competition, the energy, and that's one of the reasons why Rex Ryan and Woody Johnson wanted us to do uh, hard knocks with the Jets is because it does. Uh, they felt their team is going to be a contender, and they're going to have to. They're going to have to be used to the uh, scrutiny of the media, and uh, that's part of training camp. So um, I, I don't really buy that, and it's um, it, it's it's uh, as you pointed out, and it, it's like the, being on the cover of the Madden game or Sports Illustrated. But when you really look at it. Uh, the time that we spent with the team in hard knocks, they usually start out, come right out of the blocks pretty well, and it's hard to blame hard knocks on something that happens in uh, you know November or, or December. Well, uh, I hope I answered that. <laughs> no, you did, you did, you did. And again, I was, I, it was no offense. I just really had to know. But I tell you what. This is no, I, I didn't take it that way. It's a, it was a very good question, and uh, I've been as, we've been asked that a couple times. So uh, uh, you came right into my wheelhouse with that question. Okay. Again, this is Barbershop Jay, and i got to say, if that's the case, would you please do a hard knock on the Browns? <laughs> please, <laughs> so that they can at least well, go Maybe we will. I don't know. The Browns, of course, have such a great tradition. And, uh, you know, when we uh, started NFL Films in 1962, uh, I remember giving a presentation at the time to the owners and coaches, and I was, you know, 20 years old, and I walk into a room, and there's Vince Lombardi, Paul Brown, George Hallis, Buddy Parker. Uh, I uh, started to talk, and nothing came out. I was uh, so intimidated. But Cleveland, uh, you know, with Paul Brown and uh, has always been such a great – to me, that's one of the greatest dynasties in NFL history when you look at the Cleveland Browns and you start with the old All-America Conference in 1946 and then coming up to uh, joining the NFL. And I've always said that, you know, people talk about the greatest quarterback of all time, 
and my vote has always gone to Otto Graham. He took his team to a championship game every year he played. And his yards per pass attempt is with something like 8.3, which is phenomenal even in this age. So, uh, you know, all of us here at NFL Films will be waiting for the Browns to make a comeback. And I think with uh, Mike there, uh, you're, you're going to be off to a good start. Well, uh, you just put yourself over with us very strongly with the kind words about the Browns here. And <laughs> we, uh, we join you in that regard. I've got a question also that might be a little bit uh, outside the box. When, when you look at the compilations that you guys have done over the years and, and the creativity uh, on those going back to the beginning of the football follies and everything that you've done uh, really ever since, I'm wondering when you go back in the archives here, you've had a lot of guys – who've been pro football players, particularly back in the day, some of them more recently, who, who've also gone on uh, to do some things in the pro wrestling rings. And when you look at how much those DVDs have sold, boy, you've got you know Bronco Nagurski, Alex Karras, you've got some guys from back in the day, and you probably wouldn't have to mm-hmm. negotiate with Vince McMahon for footage rights on anything that they did. I'm just wondering if that's ever crossed your mind, trying to tap into that uh, cross-section of people who also watch pro football. Yeah, we did a piece with Leo Namalini, who played with the and Wahoo McDaniel and Buck Buchanan. And I'm trying to think there was a linebacker, oh, Ron Pritchard, for the Oilers, uh, who went into uh, pro wrestling. But we've we've done we've never done a documentary about pro wrestling. That that's almost a, a whole separate uh, genre. But we we have done pieces. Uh, uh, actually, I think um, uh, Laurinaitis, isn't his father a professional wrestler? Uh, yes, sir. He he was Road Warrior Animal, one of the most prominent yeah. guys of the 1980s. That's a great place well, actually, to right there. All right. Well, we're doing a piece on him uh, for our show on ESPN. Call, on, uh, it's called NFL Films Presents. We're on ESPN once the season starts in the afternoons. And I'm just looking at our... Uh, at our show schedule, and I see we're doing a piece on Laurinaitis, father and son, and, his, and the father is a wrestler. So, uh, to answer your question, yes. Okay. <laughs> now, over the years, I, I know you've been to every Super Bowl, and and a lot of them have been exciting the last few years, like the New York Giants against the Patriots, the Arizona Cardinals against the Pittsburgh Steelers. What do you think was the best Super Bowl that you ever watched? Whoa, boy! That uh, you know, when you say the best, I think you name. I think the the Giants and the Patriots was was an incredible game because of what was at stake. The Patriots are going for an undefeated season. The Giants, uh, to me, that was uh, a game that was not only in my mind the biggest upset, but had the most memorable play in the Manning to Tyree, uh, you know, completion. But when you talk to to me about Super Bowls, and, and uh, to me, the one I remember is the first one. Uh, and that wasn't really a good game, but the expectation and the uh, the fact that no one really knew what to expect. No one knew what was going to happen, and there was so much at stake for Lombardi's Packers because he told the team, if we get beat, the whole legacy of the Green Bay Packers that we've built up for the last six or seven years is going to go right down the toilet. So there was a, an incredible amount of pressure, and no one knew what to expect. I mean, Hank Stram was a very innovative coach. He had the move pocket, the stack, the, the triple stack defense. And to me, as someone working with the NFL, that was my fifth year at the league, there was a lot at stake for us, too. Uh, that, that it was important that the NFL win and win decisively. So to me, I still remember the feeling I had at, at, at halftime when it was 14-10. It was still close, and it wasn't until Will, Willie Wood picked off Len Dawson's pass in the third quarter and then the Packers started to pull away that uh, that Super Bowl meant the most to me. Uh, even though I don't think it was one of the best games, but to me personally, there was so much uh, there was so much at stake, and there's so many things that I remember. I remember Lombardi being so tense about before that game that th- those were the days when a head coach would wear a necktie, and he knotted his necktie so tight he had a Windsor knot. It was the size of a marble. That at the end of the game, I was doing an interview with him, and he was trying to take off his tie to go in and you know change, take a shower. He couldn't undo his tie; the knot was so tight because he was so tense before the game. And the uh, equipment manager, Dad Brazier, was his name, came over with a pair of tape shears and had to cut his necktie off his neck. And the punchline to that story was. A month later, we were showing the highlight film to Coach Lombardi in his basement, and when that scene came up, his wife, 
Marie raised hell with him because apparently that tie had been a, an expensive $45 Hermes tie that she'd got him for Christmas in New York. And when she saw that, you know, I guess he never told her, uh, you know, what had happened. When she saw that scene, uh, all hell broke loose in the Lombardi basement. Uh, and uh, no one ever talked to us about the film. It was just uh, how upset uh, Coach Lombardi's wife was that, uh, you know, he destroyed that necktie, which she'd given him as a, a Christmas present. Barbershop Jay here again. When you speak about uh, Mr. Lombardi, and again, I, I love all of the NFL film stuff. I, I'm watching anytime I can, anytime I can, because I just love the, the camera work and everything. It's just so innovative, and it, again, it's a pleasure to watch. But when you say Mr. Thank Lombardi, you. I think about the one scene where he says, "What we're trying to do is create a seal here and a seal here." And run oh, right yeah. up there. Mm-hmm. And, and get a seal that, here and a seal here, and you run the ball in the alley. Yeah, and then the yeah. other bites were everybody grabbing out there, nobody tackling. Grab, grab, grab. Put your damn shoulder in there. Uh, yeah. But yeah. but actually, I should mention that we're in the process now of doing a, a documentary on Coach Lombardi that's going to be on HBO in December. And we've been working on this uh, for the last uh, four or five months, and I think it's it's certainly, as far as I'm concerned, it's the last the last time around for me doing anything on Coach Lombardi, and we think it's going to be the definitive final documentary on his life and career, and that'll be on HBO in December. I've got to look forward to that. Now, I want to ask you, the the, a, the old AAFC records should they be included in the Hall of Fame, or you know, in the, I think in they the are. I'm sorry. They are because if you it, the Canton, uh, it's not the National Football League Hall of Fame. Okay. It's the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So the old All America Conference record. I mean, Spec Sanders, I think, record has an has a average something like a six point three yards per carry in for the I think it was the New York Yanks when they played in the old uh, AF old All America Conference, and the Forty ers were in it. The Colts were in it. Uh, I forget who, who else was in it, but uh, I, I believe that the Browns went through a whole season undefeated, didn't they? Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. I think it was 47 or or 48 that uh, I know Dante Lavelli and uh, Len Ford tell me once that they thought that team was the best, was better than the teams that won NFL championships in the 50s. Wow. Well, that's uh, that's quite a statement right there. Uh, certainly, uh, I've I've got a two part question for you because I know we're kind of uh, winding down on your availability of time here. I wanted to ask you as far as the potential for repurposing some of the old game films that you have there. I mean, you you have a library that is just unmatched, and and I know that uh, when our senior producer Steve Servillo was out there, you know, I, I said to him that uh, when you guys were gracious enough to give him the tour, I said, man, that's that's like going to the Playboy Mansion for any red blooded American, you know, getting to go there and see that. I'm one. <laughs> wondering if there's a potential for repurposing that potentially as part of your expanded online strategy and then also I wanted to give you a chance to talk about uh, your, your your art career that you've got going on and I understand there's an exhibit that's going to be coming up well uh, the first thing is that there's a hundred million feet of film in our uh, library it's the largest sports film uh, library in the world and the only other human endeavor that has been recorded more extensively on 16 millimeter film than the National Football League is World War II, and eventually we're going to pass them. But what? Uh, and the, the first question I was really, and that's the one I think is, I probably should spend the time on answering, is that I think eventually with the internet is that our entire library will be available to fans on the internet. So if you're a uh, Earl Campbell fan, and you want to see, uh, you know, I want to see all our Earl Campbell's touchdowns, you'll be able to access our library and just punch up Earl Campbell touchdowns, and every one of his touchdown runs will come up. Or if you're a Browns fan and you want to see something with Bernie Kosar or Brian Seip, uh, all of that, uh, you know, every uh, Brian Seip uh, touchdown pass will be uh, uh, accessible through the Internet. So, um, that, that's going to be, but it's still three, four, maybe five years away, and it's going to come through the NFL.com. But we're at the process now of of logging and categorizing that. Groundbreaking. So we get to see all of you know Derek Anderson <laughs> highlights. 
That's right. Online. You'll be able to see uh, anything that you want. And, and I think to, to older fans, it'll be great to be able to go back and, and see the, the Dub Jones scoring six touchdowns against the Bears in, in one game. Uh, get to see the, the you know, um, um, uh, Lou Saban. Uh, people remember him as a coach. He was a great linebacker for for the old Browns, and uh, a lot of the things that uh, you know. To me, Paul Brown, if, uh, when you think of the history of the National Football League, well, George Hallis was was is the George Washington, but Paul Brown was the Thomas Jefferson. He gave the the, the game of football. The, the, he brought it into the modern era with a passing pocket, with uh, you know um, training camps. He invented the face mask. He uh, invented the draw play. He really brought pro football into the, the, the entire game, not just pro football, into the modern era. And I know whenever I talk to Bill Belichick, the one coach that he feels you know is is the one that's influenced the game more than anyone more than than a Sid Gilman more than a Bill Walsh more than Lombardi or Shula is Paul Brown mm. well I gotta tell you I'm I'm looking forward to everything that you guys are doing over there mm -hmm. at NFL Films I'll say I love the stuff that you're already doing but I gotta ask you this is Barbershop Jay again I gotta ask you you've been Mr. NFL so to speak how do you feel about the Super Bowl? We were asking just about everybody we get on here about the Super Bowl in 2014. <laughs> well, I'm conflicted. Uh, I, you know, when, when the National Football League started, for 35 years, the championship game was decided in an outdoor stadium in the winter. It was played in Chicago. It was played in Cleveland. It was played in Detroit. It was played in New York. Wow. And then there was a couple of games where the weather was really bad, and the media, led by Red Smith in New York, started to complain and say the game, the weather is, is warping the competitive nature of the game. It's, it, it especially was true in the 62 championship when the Giants and the Packers played, and the wind was so bad in Yankee Stadium that it took away Y.A. Tittle's passing game. For us as filmmakers, some of the most dramatic, greatest games have been played in terrible weather and I you know the ice bowl number one it, to me probably the greatest game in NFL history was played 16 degrees below zero in Green Bay and let's face it New York is not the Aleutian Islands we're not talking about sub freezing weather the thing that would concern me about New York is wind and that can do more to a game affect the outcome of the game than cold as filmmakers I think it'll be sort of neat to have a game in New York. It'll look different. It'll feel different. Uh, I would rather see the game played at 1 o'clock. I don't like the night games. And, again, I'm, I'm, I'm prejudiced because when you have, have a game played in the daytime, the light's better, the film looks better, we can shoot higher speed, slow motion. But, listen, I, you know, when you think of football, football's played outside. That's the way it, it, it started. The, the greatest single line in the history of, of newspaper journalism was about a football game played outside. And that was when Grantland Rice wrote the lead for the 1925 Army-Notre Dame game. And he said, outlined against the blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again. You can't, you can't write something like that if it's played in the damn dome. So... Uh, I, I think it's neat. I, I, I think it'll be interesting. In New York, it'll be a great venue for it. Uh, it'll be, and as one owner said, uh, you know, this game will put New York on the map. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show. We'd love to have you again. We had a great time. Oh, man. All right, it was fun. As always, it's fun talking about something I love to talk about, and that's and that's football. Thank you so much.